Aloha guys, this is Dr. Tom Walker coming at you from somewhere in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, I got to thinking about things, guys, and it dawned on me that we haven't really just cut to the chase and come up with the really big question. And that question to me has always been, is modern science correct in everything that it stands for and supports and proposes and theorizes? Specifically, is the universe just an accidental happenstance, which is what they maintain? Did it just, the Big Bang just happen 13.7 billion years ago and all of us eventually sprung from just purely uh, random evolutionary processes? Now, I don't have a problem with some of that, but the problem I do have is that if you agree with that, then we can go ahead and we can actually make the leap and say, well, you know, if that's the case and our life has no purpose or we don't matter, I mean, why even get out of bed in the morning? Um, and what course science says about, uh, about these feelings that we have, that, that, we, that there is more to this life than that, uh, is that these are just psychological constructs that we've evolved over the time to, to make us think our life has purpose and meaning. Now, guys, I could handle it if it didn't, I do believe. But the problem is, is that a great deal of the world's population doesn't agree with that. Of course, you could say, well, that's, those are the great unwashed masses. They don't matter. Okay, but we also have a great deal of evidence and anecdotal evidence. I know I said, I said that awful word, anecdotal. You might as well get used to it, guys, because a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about at this point, all we have is anecdotal evidence. However, that's not what we have for today. So that's the question. And of course, there is a purpose to our lives. It does matter. There is some direction to this. And we're going to talk about all that in great detail soon. Okay, where we left off last time, we were talking about the uh, consciousness studies or micro PK conducted at Princeton's fabulous pair program. Uh, we mentioned that it, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab began in 1979, operated till 2007. Dr. Robert John, um, the dean of the School of Engineering at the much respected Princeton, and the world's leading authority on electronic space travel, space propulsion, was the director of the program. Brenda Dunn, a psychologist, was the lab director and his partner in all this. And they, uh, did a great, great deal of mind, uh, of uh, earth-shattering uh, experiments with some very interesting results. Here's an example. So here's what it was, guys. They have random number generator that generates uh, binary numbers, ones and zeros, and it does it in a certain pattern. By being random, coincidence, if, if you can uh, keep an experiment like this to where it's purely random or as much as possible, then coincidence can be measured. You can measure and see what the odds were more like or were likely to be by chance alone, and that's the key. Okay, so what they were doing, they had test subjects who were attempting to change the output of this machine, and not by grabbing it and shaking it or breathing on it or bumping it or spitting on it or any other hogwash that the critics put out, using their mind, their consciousness. Okay, moving along. They were testing micropsychokinesis. Now we talked about, we'll, and we're, <laughs> I'm not going to say it. I've said it too many times already. Trust me that we're going to cover all this very soon. Psychokinesis is a, a form of ESP that's a motor phenomenon. It's where we're able to interact with physical objects or information in some undefined way. The example I used the other day was when Luke Skywalker put his hand out and, and, and will the lightsaber to come flying through the air to his hand. That's, that's a, a spectacular example of PK. And even more spectacular was when he levitated his uh, spacecraft out of the swamp there with Yoda and all that, this multi-ton vehicle. Now, I suppose it goes without saying that we don't have proof that that can be done. Sure look good in the movies, though. Okay, so what they were doing was testing micro-PK. They also did macro PK and, uh, and um, remote viewing. We'll talk about that another time. Okay. 
We will discuss the details of the pair work later, but for now, let's say it was an astounding success. Although John commented on how disappointing it was to acquire decades of profound data and not be able to get his Princeton colleagues to simply walk across the lawn and look at it. Why? Oh, it was, it's, it's on uh, psychic phenomena, so it's, it's bullshit. It can't, you, it can't exist, so there's no sense in us wasting our time going to see. Um, the original benchmark RNG random number generator work involved 2.5 million trials. Guys, this is an enormous number. You know, if it's involved a dozen, that doesn't swing much weight. 2.5 million does over 12 years with 91 test subjects or operators. The result was a Z score of six sigma. All will be explained soon. This is just a huge number, uh, which meant it's very extremely strong evidence that the results they were getting was due to a real effect and not uh, coincidence or chance. Okay, Dean Radin and Roger D. Nelson both happened to be on the faculty at Princeton at that time. And uh, so they decided to do a meta-analysis of, uh, of the pair work up to that point. Also other, in any related studies. Okay, here's the great Dr. Dean Radin and the great Dr. Roger D. Nelson. Meta-analysis was invented in 1976 by statistician Gene Glass at the University of Colorado and has since become a standard tool. Glass described it as an analysis of the analyses. It's a study of similar studies. Doctors Radin and Nelson did their research and discovered a large number of studies which had been conducted to investigate the same basic phenomenon. Some went back to, to 1959. Okay. Uh, Radin and Nelson investigated 152 reports describing 597 experimental studies and 235 control studies by 68 distinct investigators ranging from 1959 to 1987, all involving the influence of consciousness on microelectric systems such as random event generators or random number generators. When the smoke cleared, the results were stupendous. There was a seven sigma result. Because scientific studies that have sigmas of four and five get people excited. Six and seven is like uh, mind blowing. The odds of these collective studies occurring by chance alone was one times 10 to the 35th power. The odds of these collective studies occurring by chance alone was 1 times 10 to the 35th power. Uh, one science uh, uh, investigator described this as close to a racing certainty as you can have. Very impressive, guys. 152 reports describing 597 experimental studies, 235 control studies by 68 distinct investigators ranging from 1959 to 1987, all involving the influence of consciousness on microelectric systems, such as random event generators. When the smoke cleared, the results were stupendous. It was a seven sigma result. The odds of these collective studies occurring by chance alone was one times 10 to the 35th power. Many, many, many trillions. Raiden and Nelson prepared their results and hit the big time, getting published in Foundations of Physics. This is one of the big league journals. On June 12, 1989, it was entitled Evidence for Consciousness-Related Anomalies in Random Physical Systems. They concluded, therefore, after considering all of the retrievable evidence, published and unpublished, tempered, and all legitimate criticism raised to date, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that under certain circumstances, consciousness interacts with random physical systems. Whether this effect will ultimately be established as an overlooked methodological artifact, in other words, something wrong with the experiment that they haven't been able to detect so far. Oh, there's people that love that. As a novel bioelectric perturbation, the, the uh, tight ass straights uh, won't like that, the conventional, the orthodoxy, or sensitive electronic devices, or as an empirical contribution to the philosophy of mind remains to be seen. 
So, under certain circumstances, consci human consciousness can, can interact with random physical systems. Whether this is due to some overlooked methodological artifact, probably not, guys. Again, the parapsychological crowd knows that they're not liked, that they're under scrutiny, that they're attacked by the debunkers. And they go to great, great lengths to ensure that these studies address every criticism that could possibly be. Now, of course, the hardcore debunkers like the Amazing Randy. Of course, the Amazing Randy's not doing anything now because he died a couple of years ago. Uh, just come up with BS. Just make it up. People breathed on the machine, kicked it, moved it. Uh, there, or, or, of course, the big one is that, well, John and Dunn just lied about their results. Novel bioelectric perturbation we don't know about or empirical contribution to the philosophy of mind. Okay, our next topic is going to be the Global Consciousness Project. Dean Radin and Roger Nelson didn't stop there. They started the Global Consciousness Project, which has some 70 stations around the world, collecting data on global events and how they register on random number generators. Their findings have been phenomenal. Much more on this soon. As for Dean Radin, he has studied the effects of consciousness with the famed double slit experiment, which I mentioned last time, with 17 separate studies. What he's found has blown minds around the world. That story is next. Now, actually it's 16 because he did 17, but one of the 17 did not involve random, uh, um, the double slit experiment. So that's our next topic. And then after that, we talk about the Global Consciousness Project. I'm going to shamelessly promote my book again. Uh, the Forces With Us, The Higher Consciousness That Science Refused to Accept, published by Quest Books. Intro by Richard Smoley, the editor of Quest Books. It's been out uh, 11 years, and it's been translated and published in, in Portugal, translated to Portuguese and sold in Portugal. Um, but it's still, it's gotten excellent reviews. You can read it on Amazon, but it hasn't gained an audience, and it needs to, guys. This is important. I worked seven years researching and writing this book. Most of it I did before I had the internet, so I did it the old-fashioned way with books and journals and magazine articles and so forth. But during the latter part of the time, by that time, uh, I had, uh, technology had picked up enough that I had uh, acquired the internet and was able to do a lot, lot more research on that. Uh, it's available on Amazon. It's like 15 bucks, and fine bookstores everywhere. If, if there are there still fine bookstores out there, uh, there's a few. Hopefully there'll be a lot more. It's it's something I hate to see, a, a trend that I hate to see go away. Okay, guys, that's all for today. We're going to come back with one of my heroes, Dr. Dean Radin, talking about the amazing studies he did with consciousness and the effects of the famous double slit experiment. All right, guys, be there, be square. See you then. This is Dr. Tom signing off.